so at the same time that the government has been chasing down uh, people using drugs illegally, um, the FDA approved Oxycontin, uh, which you mentioned earlier, which really, um, uh, you know, seeded the modern opioid crisis, which last year killed 93,000 people in the U.S. Uh, and it, again, that begins with legal opiates. Um, so I think that fact, that historical irony, that while we were, you know, using the law to deal with illicit drugs, the pharmaceutical industry was uh, hooking huge numbers of people on opiates. Um, I think that's taken a lot of credibility out of the drug war. And that's one of the reasons the public is turning against it. Well, that's what I mean, your, your, your first essay, which is you basically being worried that you're going to become a, 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 a drug outlaw and it, just for making opium tea, which is, as you, as you say, kind of is one of those things which when, when drunk can remove some of the existential burden of, 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 of being human as drunk. If you're, so for those who don't know about this, can you give some because this is a fascinating thing where for the first time ever, the full article is published and you include what yeah. was removed for your genuine fear that yeah. uh, this could lead to incarceration. Yes, and the, and the loss of my home. And uh, because under the asset forfeiture laws, if, you're, if your property is guilty of growing a controlled substance, even if you're not convicted or tied to that, even if your kid plants a marijuana plant in the corner of your garden and you don't know about it, they can take your house. Um, you know, the damage to our civil liberties has been profound. So that story began uh, in 1996, and I was writing about gardening. Um, that was my, I, I did columns for Harper's Magazine, New York Times Magazine, and my editor sent me this underground press book called Opium for the Masses by a man named Jim Hogshire. And he was explaining how, and I've got some right here, you can grow poppies. These are the poppy heads. Um, and you can turn those poppy heads into a mild narcotic by making tea from them. Um, basically running them through a spice grinder and, uh, and soaking them in hot water or mixing them, putting them in vodka. And that gives you laudanum, a tincture. Um, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I, I just love, you know, the way gardening can, can be, we talked earlier, can be a form of alchemy. And, uh, and I wonder if I can do it. So I set out to grow these things and I wrote to Jim Hawkshire and got some advice and asked if he had any seeds he could spare. And, um, and I plant my opium poppies this is when I was living in New England. Uh, and, uh, and then I get word through a mutual friend that Jim has been arrested, that there was a raid on his apartment. Um, uh, uh, 20 uh, drug police in ninja suits, a SWAT team, comes in, throws him up against the wall, arrests him for the crime of manufacturing narcotics. The evidence? Dried poppy heads just like that, but he had bought them at a florist shop. Uh, which in and of themselves are completely legal, but growing papaverus omniferum is a federal crime if you do it in the knowledge and intent of making uh, a narcotic from it. And the proof that he was doing that was his book. He published a book on how to do it. So clearly that was his goal. And uh, they pretty much wrecked his life. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I'm growing poppies. I'm in contact with him. My email is on his hard drive. Um, and I kind of freak out. And I had this summer of um, fear and paranoia as I tried to figure out what the government was up to. And I, over time, so I did some investigation and found that indeed the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, was conducting this very quiet campaign to suppress opium growing. Um, that for many years, the government had convinced people it wouldn't grow in America. You had to, you know, it had to be Turkey or Afghanistan and you needed an army of 10 year olds with razor blades to harvest it. And um, uh, none of which was true. It grows perfectly well here, perfectly well in, in, uh, in the UK. Um, but there was this campaign going on and they were harassing gardeners. They, were, they, they pulled out the poppies that were grown at Monticello's garden, at, at Jefferson's garden at Monticello. Um, they were doing all these things. And uh, so I finished the article and um, the lawyers start warning me that there's uh, this is potentially a confession to a federal crime and uh, what I stood to lose by publishing it. Ultimately, um, and there was some conflict between different kinds of lawyers on what was what was likely to happen. But um, a lawyer who read it for the magazine said, "Look, there are two two sections here that are the most antagonistic to the government. One is the recipe for how to make poppy tea, uh, 
Um, and I have to stress what a mild narcotic this is. This is this is served at funerals in the Arab world, okay, to lift the burden of, of pain after uh, of grieving. Um, and uh, uh, and then the section, the trip report, where I describe what it feels like. So I censored myself in order to publish the piece, and I never felt right about that. Um, it seemed absurd, but but going back to the head we were in in 1997, it was a scary time. Uh, millions of people were being arrested on drug crimes, and the government was quite serious about copies. So I always wanted to publish the piece in its entirety, and, and I had the opportunity with this book. But the other thing I wanted to do was recontextualize what was happening in 96. Because unbeknownst to me, while I was growing poppies and tangling with the, the Drug Enforcement Administration, um, Purdue Pharma, the pharmaceutical company controlled by the Sackler family, was introducing OxyContin. This is a uh, reformulation of opiates that supposedly, or was marketed as being safer and less addictive, none of which was true, and the company knew this. It was also being used, uh, they promoted it as something that could be not just for people, you know, after surgery or people who were dying, but this could be used for everyone with a pain issue, back trouble, workplace injuries. And they promoted this so effectively. And they also bribed a lot of doctors. They, they got various incentives for prescribing it that um, this, this began the opioid crisis. Um, people, it was very easy to get prescriptions for Oxycontin and, uh, and some people got hooked on it. But more, what would happen is people would get addicted and then their doctors would realize what had happened and throw them off and, and stop their prescription. And then they turned to the street, to street heroin, which is very dangerous because it could be laced with fentanyl or contaminated needles or whatever it is. Um, and so we had about 5,000 opiate addicts in uh, 1996. Um, now we have that number is in the hundreds of thousands. Um, we had 93,000 deaths last year. I mean, it's been a disaster. And, and so this was going on beneath everybody's notice that same year that you know, we had this kerfuffle around poppies. It was a great lesson to me that you know, the, on the limitations of journalism, which thinks it knows what's going on in a, in a given moment in time, uh, we flatter ourselves, but in fact, there are often deeper historical currents that we can't be aware of at the time. So I was able to talk about that when I republished the piece and, and recontextualize it. And it becomes this, you know, kind of scary, but also humorous parable of the drug war and its absurdities. It's such a fascinating thing how illegality actually means the thing. So I think the same thing happened as far as I, know, I remember in London when they used to the number of heroin users when eventually doctors were no longer allowed just to do little prescriptions went through the roof and went up tenfold within less than a year. So it's uh, yeah and you know the harm the whole idea of harm reduction uh, which I think is a valid idea is like no that increased the, the harm of opiates um, by taking people off it. Uh, weirdly enough, ironically enough, sometimes keeping people on legal opiates is better for society and because they don't have to turn to the criminal world and uh, better for their health because they don't have to turn to street drugs. Um, and some cultures get it. I mean, they get this in Portugal, they get this in Switzerland. You know, in Switzerland, if you have a, a heroin habit, the government gives you heroin, um, you know what you're getting and you can maintain a productive life on it, which very few people appreciate. But then they go about fixing your life and the conditions that made you want to take heroin. Uh, so they, they, they make sure you have a good job and decent housing and good therapeutic support. And then they think you might be able to get off it. And, and often people do. So, you know, I think our understanding of addiction, which has been influenced heavily by the drug war, is, um, is that, you know, these, these chemicals have hooks that get into you and, um, uh, and exposure to them produces addiction. Well, it's curious that most people don't get addicted who use these drugs. So what does that tell us? Um, it tells us that it's not just the chemical. Um, it's, it's also the conditions uh, in which we live. And you know, um, uh, Johan Hari's book, uh, Lost Connections, he, he talked a lot about something called the Rat Park experiment. Fascinating experiment. Um, much of what we know about addiction comes from uh, these experiments where you give a rat a choice, you know, it can, it can administer morphine to its veins or, um, or sugar water, and it goes for the morphine until it's addicted and uses huge quantities of it. Um, 
And this uh, scientist in British Columbia named Bruce Alexander like took another look at that. And he said, well, let's see if we improve the cage. We sprung these rats from their isolation and put them in really nice cages with toys and good food and other rats to have sex with and play with. Let's see if they still go for the morphine. And he found they didn't. They used very little morphine and they drank the water. And they were, um, so it, that was a kind of a sign to us that let's look at the condition of our cages uh, and see what effect that has on the likelihood of becoming addicted. But I, th I think it seems that in, in Britain and the US, we're quite addicted to the idea of people being villains and villainy generally, and whatever you may well turn to that is illegal. That's because, you know, I, I think somewhere in there, we still seem to have an addiction to the idea that you are genetically likely to. Yes, you know, there is this the idea of society. Yes, that it's genetic, that it's in general, that it's all biology, but we don't like to look at social environment and political environment. And uh, I mean, if you look at the map of the, the geography of the opioid crisis in America, the places where you have the highest rates of addiction uh, and, and death due to opiates, you find that these are very depressed places. This is not happening in Manhattan or, or California. This is happening in states that, where their industry has collapsed. Uh, the old coal mining states, the you know, Appalachia, um, places where people's prospects are very limited and their opportunities for pleasure are very limited. And so people are medicating. And, um, uh, and so, you know, it argues instead of a war on drugs uh, for a war on poverty uh, as a way to deal with it. Um, but of course, we'd much prefer to, you know, moralize drug taking and moralize addiction as, as, the, as a character fault. Um, and I think it's a lot more complicated than that. It's like those periods of time in the, the 18th and 19th century where, why is it that the poor steal bread? It must be something to do with a, a bread stealing gene. Might be they've got no bread and they're really hungry. Yeah, but they do seem to steal more bread than the people who are full with money. Yeah. I don't know why. Um, I want to quickly, because there's so much, as usual with all your books, there are so many ideas uh, in it. But I, I just, what's always fascinating me is your journey from a teenage gardener and how this has which obviously had you know great influence on on your consciousness and, and your involvement with plants but how it's become so much more active in terms of actually not really understanding the relationship with the plants but actually by you know getting involved in the plants by taking the plants by you know with ideas of mescaline as well all of these things i'd, I'd just like to get a sense of your changing relationship from being the teenage gardener you, you describe gardening sometimes as all gardeners like to think of themselves as alchemists and you've yeah. definitely in terms of your level of alchemy it, it's developed a great deal hasn't it in 40 years yeah you know all my work comes out of the garden uh it's very interesting um but i started writing about what was happening in my garden back in the late late 80s and i published my first book it was really it was called second nature and it was very much about using the garden as a laboratory to explore our engagement with the natural world um and i think the garden is a dynamic and very exciting place and in addition to the beauty that we see there and the tasty things we can grow, there's this dance of neurochemistry going on between the plants and us and the plants and insects uh, and bees. And um, uh, so I've, it's a, it's, it goes way back with me. And I've always been amazed, and I'm still amazed when I go out in my garden and harvest, that from a seed, you can pr produce something of great value that these gifts of nature, um, these beautiful things to look at, beautiful things to taste, and these things, these, these plants that have devised the precise neurochemistry to unlock a neurotransmitter in our brain that affects our consciousness. Now, I, I grew some cannabis when I was, uh, you know, in, as a teenager and in my 20s, and that too was amazing that I could actually like produce this on my own. And not, not on my own, of course, it's the plants who do the work. And I've always been intrigued by the fact that, like, why do plants do this? What's in it for them? Um, well, it's been a very good evolutionary strategy. If you think about cannabis or opiate, opiates, papaver somniferum, that when, even though these chemicals were probably devised by them in evolution as a pesticide, at low doses, they were very attractive to mammals like us. And that the plants that figured out figured this out, uh, and I use that, you know, advisedly, 
um, were the ones that thrived. And the cannabis had its seeds carried all around the world, Papaver somniferum also, that this was a great evolutionary strategy to gratify our age old human desire to change consciousness, which is also very curious. Why did we evolve to wanna to change consciousness? Drug taking is dangerous. It, it can kill you. Um, it can lead you to be sloppy and more vulnerable to prey or to accidents. Um, yet the drug takers have not been edited out by natural selection, right? I mean, if it was maladaptive, it would be gone and it's certainly not gone. So what, what good are drugs? What is this dance between us and plants about? Well, drugs are very good for relieving pain. We know that for the opiates, both psychological and physical pain. They're very good to deal with boredom. Uh, something about us is not satisfied with everyday normal consciousness. But I think they have some higher order benefits to our species uh, that make them, um, that make the benefits outweigh the risks. And one is the, um, the creative input of drugs to cultural evolution. Um, you know, think of the poets, uh, think of what Coleridge got out of opium. Um, uh, think of what, you know, Ken Kesey got out of psychedelics. I mean, that the, the, a lot of the insights that occur to people on psychedelics and drugs are really stupid. We should, we should stipulate that. People have a lot of stupid ideas. Um, but that's evolution, right? Mutations, most of them aren't very good. Uh, most of them lead to, you know, death and, um, and the end of the line. Um, but every now and then the encounter of one of these molecules with the human mind produces something incredibly valuable. And we, you'd have to go back to ancient history to, to exactly figure out what that was. But it seems to me human ideas, such as the idea that there is an afterlife or an underworld or another unseen realm, these ideas, these visions that are at the heart of many religions, where did they come from? Were they occasioned by psychedelics? Uh, I think that that's not an unreasonable hypothesis. Um, and so I think that they've made all sorts of contributions to, to cultural evolution. Um, and, and certainly we have the testimony of various scientists on the insights they had on drugs and specifically on psychedelics. So I think that they've been, I, I think of them as mutagens, you know, in the same way that solar radiation can cause a mutation in a genome that leads to something good or probably bad. Um, drugs are um, mutagens in the realm of means, and they, um, uh, they every now and then contribute something really important. Um, so I think that's why they've stuck around. And I think that that's um, one of the reasons they're so interesting. Just that fun book, isn't it? Is it about 1970? John Allegro's uh, book, The Mushroom yeah. and the Sacred Cross. Yeah, about uh, the role in Christianity. And there's been some recent research about that. Um, a guy named Brian Maruruscu wrote a book, published a book last year uh, about archaeology, uh, looking at the use of psychoactives in early religion. And, you know, the, the, the Eleusian mysteries um, in ancient Greece, it was known that um, everybody who was anybody in Greek society for like a thousand years participated in this rite to Demeter. And there was something called a kikion, which was a potion that everybody took that allowed them to visit the underworld and, 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 and talk to their ancestors. And nobody knows what it was. And everybody was sworn to secrecy about it. And it could only be used in this ritual. So people have been looking for that. And recently in this, uh, this book tells this account of these archeologists in Spain who found uh, residues of ergot, which is the fungus that produces LSD um, in communion cups, uh, suggesting that in early Christianity, it wasn't just wine um, and that the, the, the sacrament that allowed you to uh, commune with God in some sense may have been, uh, had a psychedelic element to it. Um, so we haven't nailed this down yet completely, but there's some really intriguing evidence um, that the Greek use of wine, you know, so I was always curious that they, they would drink wine in like thimbles and, and then have these Dionysian experiences. I'm like, there's gotta be something else in that wine. Um, and it looks like there probably was. Yeah, that paper wafer that the Anglicans are getting really is a rip off to be quite honest. That's not, I mean, <laughs> 
that that makes me wonder about how much do you th do you think there's a fact that once once the priests kind of got to corporate level once it becomes you know these great big institutions because you write about the mexican inquisition and the fact that you know peyote was described it as was a threat, threat. And absurdity and is that because and there's a point perhaps where you go we don't want the people having visions because we've now got the visions written down and we have the right. series of things they need to obey and so that's it for the visions yeah oh absolutely i mean when religion gets kind of bureaucratized or ossified you you want the power of the priesthood depends on them having special access to the divine if everybody is having their own relationship to the divine who needs a priest who needs the whole structure and indeed, that's what the Reformation was about, you know, people who felt that they could, you know, go around the priesthood and wanted to. And um, when the Spanish got to Mexico and they saw people who were uh, communing with their gods using a sacrament called psilocybin or peyote, um, this was enormously threatening because it was, you know, honestly a superior sacrament. You didn't need faith. You didn't need imagination. You actually could talk to God. And um, uh, so they crushed it uh, brutally. Um, they crushed both the peyote cults and the psilocybin cults. And of course, they call them cults. If you know, if if you if you don't like a religion, you call it a cult. Um, and uh, and what what is amazing is that they didn't completely eliminate it, and that it went underground, and that you had 500 years of secret mushroom cults and uh, people continuing to use them. But it, I think psychedelics uh, and drugs in general are, are threatening to various bureaucracies and whose authority depends on um, having this special knowledge that no one else can have. Where, whereas the use of drugs in a way threatens to democratize religion. And, and, and that's, you know, a lot of people don't like that. I, I, I'm going to have to go to the questions now, which is annoying. As usual, I was actually going to start, I think we said before we did this, we're going to start talking about nitrous oxide and William James, but we never quite managed to start talking about that, uh, which uh, we have to do that again another time. Uh, I also okay. want to talk about some of the papers about bees as well that you have. Oh, yeah, the, bees, bees and caffeine. And caffeine. Yeah, we're not the only creature that likes caffeine, as it turns out, but...